Hello and welcome to the Last Week in AI podcast, where you can hear us chat about what's going on with AI. As usual, in this episode, you will summarize and discuss some of last week's most interesting AI news. You can also check out our Last Week in AI newsletter at lastweekin.ai for articles we did not cover in this episode. I am one of your hosts, Andrei Korenkov. I finished my PhD focused on AI at Stanford last year, and I now work at a generative AI startup. And with us uh, for this episode is not Jeremy, we have another co-host. Hey, I'm Daniel. If you've listened to every episode of this podcast, then you've definitely heard me before. But I've I've subbed for Jeremy a couple of times. I, I co-run with Andre another publication called The Gradient, hosts the podcast over there, and I currently work on ML compilers. That's right. So if you are curious about another podcast we have mentioned in the past, Daniel hosts the Gradient podcast where he interviews a whole bunch of people from the world of AI, a lot of academics, but also people in industry. Uh, I used to do also interviews on there. So uh, FYI, that exists. And uh, if you uh, think that Daniel's deep voice is something that you like listening to, maybe you'll want to check that one out. Before we dig into news, just a couple things uh, to get out of the way. First, as I like to do, just want to give thanks to a couple new points of feedback. We had a new uh, review on Apple Podcasts, uh, said every other week in AI that this review highlighted that there's so much in every one of these episodes that sometimes it's hard to even get in a whole episode uh, once per week, and that's understandable. Uh, This one, I think it will keep a little bit shorter, so hopefully you can finish it this week. But uh, yes, thank you, Nostin SF, for that review. And we also had a few subscribers on Substack coming through and sending us messages uh, as they subscribed. Uh, Like one message said, you guys are a major part of my podcast repertoire. And talking about meticulous coverage and depth of analysis, things we, I guess, are trying to do. So, yes, thank you for those messages. We do read them, even if you don't reply, and we appreciate it. And one last thing before we get into news, as we have been doing, we need to do our sponsor read. And once again, we are sponsored by the Super Data Science Podcast. So, the Super Data Science Podcast, as you know, if you've been listening to, is one of the top technology podcasts globally, and they cover not just data science, but also machine learning, AI, data careers, all sorts of topics in that space. It is hosted by John Crone, the chief data scientist and co founder of a machine learning company, Nebula, and the author of Deep Learning Illustrated. And the host of this podcast uh, for quite a while. This podcast has now over 700 episodes. They release twice a week. So he has talked to a huge variety of people, knows a ton about data science, AI, machine learning. And if you want to learn more from a perspective of people, we do recommend that one as a podcast to check out. So our first section today is on tools and applications. And we're going to start off with, well, There have been a lot of releases recently. You've probably heard about many of them. And the one we're going to start off with today is Inflection 2.5. You may have heard about Inflection's personal AI before called Pi. And the the claim around is it's competitive with leading language models like GPT-4, like Gemini. And really the point is that Pi is not just a an engine with raw capabilities, but they have this unique empathetic fine tuning on top of it. And so really the point is for it to act more as a personal assistant to help you get the things you want to do done. They've also made some strides in pretty standard areas like coding and mathematics. So that's pretty important for key industry benchmarks, but they're also incorporating real-time web search capabilities, providing users with high quality breaking news, up-to-date information. It's interesting, I suppose, because I feel like Inflection's name, for me at least, kind of fell out of the limelight for a while. But now that they're back with 2.5, I'm kind of curious what that's going to look like. That's right. Yeah, just as we are seeing all these releases of Gemini and Cloud Free at about the same time, Inflection came out with this announcement of Inflection 2.5. And they highlight yeah a couple of things approaching GPT-4 performance but also using only 40% of the amount of compute for training, apparently. 
And they say they've already rolled this out, and they see, like, they highlight some pretty big numbers here. So they say that an average conversation with Pi lasts 33 minutes, and one in 10 lasts over an hour each day. So people are talking to this Pi assistant uh, or Pi chatbot a lot, and uh, they do highlight, I guess, their main pitch with Pi is that it is kind of emotionally intelligent on top of being just uh, IQ intelligent. So they have optimized it to be kind of a pleasant conversation uh, partner, so to speak. So yeah, uh, another release of a major model, uh, more cool numbers here. They have a lot of uh, tables showing a pretty uh, big jumps between inflection one and inflection 2.5, and a lot of them being near GP4. So the train of new models and uh, you know new GP4 competitors keeps rolling out. But it's it's hard to emphasize enough. Thirty three minutes is an impressive conversation length. And the 60% of users returning the following week is also very impressive stickiness. I don't know about you, Andre, but like I I do not spend 20, let alone 33 minutes in a conversation with GPT-4 or Claude. That's true, yeah. So I think it's in that class with uh, character.ai, uh, Pi is one of these things that for many people, they do appear to just enjoy having conversations i can't say that i do that but it is a thing that's happening uh just fyi it's true and on to the next story which is introducing devon the first ai software engineer which is coming from cognition labs and this uh kind of took the world of ai i guess conversation by storm this last week there was a video posted on twitter or x Uh, where they highlighted this release, uh, what they say is the fully autonomous AI software engineer. And basically, yeah, it's it's a much better, more uh, sophisticated uh, kind of agent that in various benchmarks is much more impressive. They evaluated on SWE bench, software engineering bench, and found that it correctly resolved 13.8% 13.8% uh, of issues end-to-end, which is exceeding the previous state of art by a lot before it was just a couple percent. Uh, and they say that it's also been tested on real-world tasks, such as jobs on Upwork. And you know they have various demos. They also showed how it can... Uh, write a little uh, code to use a computer vision model using modal, and it can do all of this kind of from documentation without being trained specifically to do that. So lots of examples of what this can do. And yeah, seemingly as far as I've seen, and as far as I think most people in the community have seen, the most impressive uh, fully autonomous uh, programming agent, as they say. I want to make like two notes about this. For one, I guess I am a person who like never trusts recorded demos. And I think that a lot of people on Twitter are also this way. If you want to see somebody who got access to Devon and then started looking at some of its different capabilities, there's a guy named Andrew Gao, I want to say. And he's tested it out on a couple of different things and found that I think there was one task... I can't quite remember it. It was related a bit to graphics that it didn't quite do so well on. It made this like kind of working version of Flappy Bird that wasn't too great. And then somebody else came along with a website called App Crapper that created something a lot better. Uh, he also, I think, had it set about fine tuning an LLM. So that's interesting. Seems like it can do a couple of pretty useful things. Um, that being said, obviously, it seems like there's a lot of work to do yet, given the SWE bench performance, the fact that uh, Cognition Labs is still hiring human engineers. So I think that says a couple of things there. I, I also want to like caution about discourse when it comes to we have this thing that is called an AI software engineer and everybody's saying it's all over when it comes to the job of a software engineer. Uh I, I don't feel like we have nearly enough data to make strong predictions about what this means yet. And it's a little bit irresponsible to say that if you're a software engineer, you're not going to have a job in five years because of this thing. So I, I just want to caution about making very strong claims like this in 
the light of these new releases. That's a very good point. I think this is a step in that direction, but it's still pretty far. Uh, it hasn't necessarily been shown to, uh, for instance, work within the context of very large uh, software repositories. Uh, although it, it can look at like GitHub repos and so on, but the job of a software engineer is pretty complex. There's a lot there besides just like solving a task or addressing an issue on GitHub. So uh, let's not kind of get carried away. It's impressive. And if you look at the demos, they do have some videos of this agent uh, having various capabilities. It, it has access to a shell, to a browser, and it can do all sorts of planning and iteration given output of a program. So it, it is definitely more sophisticated than just launching ChatGPT to write code, but it is also still pretty far from in fact, uh, replacing what most software engineers do. So next up for our lightning round, if you have ever run into a driver who seems to be sexually harassing you or you're just an incredibly mean person, well, DoorDash has a, has a new tool for you. It's called SafeChat Plus, and it's designed to detect and reduce verbally abusive and inappropriate reaction interactions between customers and delivery personnel. It reviews in-app conversations, identifies harassment, provides options to report the incident, contact DoorDash's support team, or cancel the order without affecting the delivery person's ratings. And they're putting up some, some numbers here. It can analyze over 1,400 messages per minute in multiple languages. These include English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Mandarin. And all incidents identified by the AI will be investigated by team members. This is, uh, again, one of those rollouts that I think is a, a pretty positive direction. Again, you know, detecting verbal abuse just seems like an unabashedly good thing. Uh, if you are worried about something reviewing all of your in-app conversations, well, I mean, you're, you're on DoorDash, so I feel like this isn't really a place where you should be too worried about that or having conversations that you wouldn't want an AI to look at. But uh, interesting, interesting addition to the platform. The SafeChat Plus, the save at the previous SafeChat was, I guess, mainly or entirely manual screening, which seems a little bit crazy. But uh, as you might imagine, basically any online platform presumably is going to be using AI to screen what you send, uh, at least if there's this sort of like consumer uh, interface between you and a delivery person or something, it would make sense for them to be doing this kind of thing. Next up, the story is Anthropic releases Claude Free Haiku, an AI model built for speed and efficiency and affordability. So we covered Claude Free, I think, just last week. At the time, they had not yet released the smaller variant Haiku, and that is the story that now they have. And uh, yeah, they highlight pretty much that it is by far the fastest and cheapest of the Claude Free family while still being pretty sophisticated. It, it also has vision capabilities and the other things we highlighted about Cloud Free previously. So for, I think, many sort of quasi real time applications, we might uh, start to see them being powered by this. And next up is looking into the domain of video. You've probably heard about Pika Labs before, which made a lot of waves when it came to generating AI videos. They have introduced a new feature that allows users to create sound effects from a text prompt for its generative AI videos. So you're not just seeing what's on the screen, you're getting to hear it too. And this is the second audio feature on their platform. They previously had created a lip sync tool that allows users to give voices to characters in their AI videos. Uh, again, the this, this sound effects feature is only available to pro plan subscribers and so on. They, they have to make a little bit of money here. Uh, and it seems like the sound effects that are generated from single text prompts are fairly impressive. They generally mirror what the user requests. But again, you know, these are, we're, we're still pretty early, I think, when it comes to where generative videos are. And right now you have tools like Sora, but there's a lot that needs to be done here. Generating AI videos is incredibly computationally expensive. For instance, people are still working on image generation at this point. So I do think that the area of vision generally is pretty underexplored, but it's exciting to see what people are putting together. That's right. Yeah, yet another release from Pika Labs coming pretty quick after that leap 
syncing feature we also covered. And they have a little highlight reel. They show various things, kind of stuff you would see in ads. Uh, so a lot of quick cuts of shots of, I don't know, bacon roasting or a car racing or a little fly. And you have the sound effect of a car on the road or bacon or all that sort of thing. And it works. Yeah. As you said, if you just look at the video, it seems pretty good. In practice, I would imagine some might work better and some worse, but uh, yeah, another uh, addition to the world of AI video generation, which is seeming to move pretty pretty fast this year. Next up, Salesforce announces new AI tools for doctors. And these are tools designed to reduce the administrative workload for healthcare workers. So the first tool is Einstein Copilot, uh, colon health actions, which allows doctors to book appointments, summarize patient information, and send referrals using conversational AI. The second tool, assessment generation, enables organizations to digitize health assessments like surveys without manual typing or coding. And these are on their uh, Salesforce Einstein One platform, which uh, apparently is already using uh, or is being used to consolidate medical data from various sources. So yeah, another we've we've covered kind of uh, some efforts on along this line. Usually, you need a large company to be able to get through all the bureaucracy of doing healthcare stuff. But there's a lot of room to uh, help with this kind of administrative workload. So personally, I think this is a pretty exciting announcement. Yeah, I'm I'm generally excited about this domain too. I. I interviewed Shiv Rao, who started a company, and this was a while back. They're called Abridge, and they've been building something that kind of transforms patient clinician conversations into structured clinical notes. And this is all powered by, you know, your generative AI stuff that everybody's excited about. And uh, it sounds like Salesforce is trying to get into something a little bit similar, maybe broader and slightly different parts of the administrative work doctors have to do. So... I'm kind of curious to see what the competition landscape looks like for this, but I do think that the point really hits home. Uh, doctors, they do a lot of administrative work. They do a lot of work in general. The more you can free them up from having to do these kinds of things, enabling them to do what they were trained for to be doctors, generally a good thing. And on to applications and business with a first story, once again, being about OpenAI and their never-ending seemingly drama. Well, maybe they are ending. We covered uh, last week, I think, how the report as to the uh, kind of summary of conclusions about this whole board incident that happened last year came out and didn't say very much. Now, there was coverage, uh, I guess, to just highlight that as a consequence of that report coming out, there's been updates to the board, which we kind of knew uh, was happening. So Sel Sam Altman has rejoined the OpenAI board along with three new board members. We have uh, Sue Desmond Hellman, the former CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, former, former Sony Entertainment Executive Nicole Seligman, and Fiji Simo, CEO of Instacart. So you're seeing, uh, yeah, some, I guess, bigger names coming onto the board. Uh, as a quick recap, in case you forgot somehow or missed it, this is falling on the heels of the board basically firing Sam Altman as the CEO of OpenAI last year in a very dramatic move. And so since then, that got you know, rolled back and they've been working on updating the board and kind of improving the governance structure so that kind of drama doesn't happen again. This is, I guess, a move towards uh, creating that stability. I've honestly given up on trying to follow all this a while ago. I think that even the first weekend where Altman was fired and, and all this was going on, it was just like, this is, it's it's just entertainment at that point. But it is, it is interesting to think about the governance measures. They do have a pretty complicated structure, and the board has announced a couple of new ones, including a whistleblower hotline for OpenAI employees and contractors, and a stronger conflict of interest policy. So that's all interesting and pretty important. I, I do think also, even if all of this is, is tiring for you, it's this company has built tools that a lot of people are using, and that 
internal turmoil, as people were realizing when all of this drama was first happening. That's pretty important for the many, many, many companies out there who are relying on GPT 3.5, GPT 4, all of these things in order to build the products they're trying to build. Yes. And as we covered before, we still don't have a full picture of what exactly happened. It seems basically like like there was an eternal fight going on. Uh, it seemed like Altman took issue with one of the board members uh, issuing critical remarks in an academic work and then potentially tried to get that board board member removed as a result of some of that maneuvering. It seemed like there's some basically politics going on, right? And uh, it kind of backfired. So there was a brief comment from Altman kind of saying indirectly that he probably could have handled some of the uh, actions that he was doing uh, better, he said, with more grace and care. Uh, either way, I guess probably we all should be ready to just put this behind us at this point. The board is updated and uh, they have all this investigation notes and so on to reassure the investors of OpenAI that from now on, there shouldn't be this kind of upheaval again. And our next item, Cohere is coming back into the limelight. They announced the release of a major new language model called Command-R. And this is interesting. They're they're in the midst of a heated fundraising round right now that could bring as much as a billion dollars in fresh capital to them. But Command R is, is a pretty interesting model. It's a pretty significant leap forward for their technology. It offers enhanced performance on key AI tasks like retrieval augmented generation, which you've probably heard about, and tool use, as well as longer context windows up to 128,000 tokens. Not quite what others are claiming right now, but still a, a pretty big context window, as well as more affordable pricing, as everybody wants more affordable pricing and you know better latency throughput numbers, as literally everybody will claim to you. Uh, but also, interestingly, they're kind of expanding as a company and making strides on the business front. So lots lots going on for Cohere right now. Yeah, we are covering this in, in this section rather than tools and apps because Cohere focuses on enterprise use cases. So this is not kind of consumer facing. This is something that they're aiming to sell to businesses. And yeah, it's worthwhile to kind of keep Cohere in mind. Uh, they are still one of the big players in the space. As you said, they are looking to bring in like a billion dollars. They already have spent hundreds of millions training these models and they are expanding it with more offices and so on. So uh, yeah, Cohere still doing quite a lot. And this new Command R model that now has uh, retrieval augment generation and tool use, they say, is very accurate. Uh, they like have a little table saying that they have an accuracy of seven uh, 75.2, as opposed to mixed trial or GPT-3, which are more in the 60s. So still a significant player to be aware of, for sure. And first up in our lightning round, Meta has written a little bit about building their generative AI infrastructure. You might have heard about their research super cluster a while back, where they had gotten 16,000, I believe, NVIDIA H100s, really, really investing in their compute for doing lots and lots of open generative AI research. And they've again announced a major investment in that AI infrastructure, including two 24,000 GPU clusters. These are built on top of Grand Teton, OpenRack, PyTorch, and they aim to grow that infrastructure to include 350,000 NVIDIA H100 GPUs by the end of 2024. That would provide the compute power equivalent to nearly 600,000 H100s. And these are going to support current next generation AI models, including Llama 3, as well as AI research and development across Gen AI and other areas. Uh, again, this is kind of really putting into Meta's long term vision. They want to build very strong artificial intelligence systems that are open, responsibly built. You've seen them release the Llama models by this point. Those are only going to get pushed further. I'm kind of interested to see. All this investment in NVIDIA because Meta has kind of joined the uh, the cohort of companies who are continuing to build their own, <clears throat> excuse me, their own training and inference accelerators. So I'm kind of curious to see how 
their their usage of compute kind of evolves. That internal you know training inference accelerator work is going to be pretty hard and obviously behind where Nvidia is by a long shot. But it is interesting to see that kind of continued investment in this massive basically super cluster of NVIDIA GPUs along with that development. Yeah, it was interesting to see them release this blog post titled Building Meta's Gen AI Infrastructure, where they went into a whole lot of detail like about the technical details of what they're doing. They had these numbers of, by the end of 2024, they're aiming to roll out a uh, build, including 3,500 uh, including 350,000 NVIDIA H100 GPUs. So that's like tens of millions of dollars worth of compute. Uh, And uh, yeah, they really, I guess, are emphasizing that they are investing a lot in a large-scale compute, uh, which we heard about before, but seeing this blog post with a lot of details on it really drove it home. Next up, Baidu launches China's first 24-7 robotaxi service. So Baidu, which is a huge company in China, in case you're not aware, it's you could say similar to the Google uh, of China, has launched this service Apollo Go in selected areas of Wuhan. And it is a 24-7 robotaxi service akin to Waymo. This is the third major expansion of this service in 2024, following the launch of the fully driver service across the Yangtze River in Wuhan and their pilot operation on highways to the Beijing Daxing Airport. So yeah, it seems like uh, similar to the US in a sense, we are just starting to see fully self-driving cars become commercial. We've seen Waymo driving around San Francisco 24-7 for a while, and it is now also the case in China. Our next section, projects and open source. Our first story here is about a new metadata format for ML-ready datasets. And without verifying this at all, I have to guess that the developers and researchers who worked on this are based in France, because it's called Croissant. and an important the, the thing that's kind of important about this is that ML practitioners often spend quite a lot of time understanding, organizing data sets, and there's a wide variety of data representations. If you spent any time as an ML engineer, you spent lots and lots of time working with data, working with data pipelines. It's, it's a big headache. Uh, there are existing metadata formats like schema.org, like DCAT, that aren't designed for specific needs of ML data. And these needs are extracting, combining data from various sources, including metadata for responsible use, defining training test validation sets. So they introduced this new metadata format for ML-ready data sets. It's developed collaboratively by a community from industry and academia as part of the ML Commons effort. It doesn't change how the actual data is represented. Of course, they wouldn't want to. But it provides a standard way to describe and organize it, building upon existing things like schema.org, but augmenting that with comprehensive layers for ML-relevant metadata, data resources, data organization, default ML semantics. And so some of the major tools and repositories you're probably aware of, Kaggle, Hugging Face, OpenML, and so on, the popular ML frameworks, are going to begin supporting the format for the data sets they host. Right. Yeah, it's a bit of a nerdy topic, metadata format for ML data sets. But if you're, you know, if you're doing work in the AI space uh, and have interacted with various data sets, you might know that at least when I was uh, doing this, there wasn't much of a like specification. Everyone just kind of did their own thing and it was every <laughs> every repository had its own approach to representing data. So this seems to yeah introduce a new standard where things will be a little bit more organized and have uh, more rich information. Uh, it'll have things like uh, you know data resources, data organization, default ML semantics, and uh, various tools also to uh, uh, interact with this metadata. So yeah, a real sign that uh, engineering for ML and sort of the whole space of machine learning and AI is maturing a little bit with something like this coming out and possibly becoming a little more standardized. We'll see. 
And next story, also on the open source front, is Sol LM 7B, a pioneering large language model from uh, for law. So yeah, this is a new open source uh, model specifically for legal tasks. It was uh, fine-tuned on top of the Mistral 7B architecture and is trained on an English legal corpus with er over 30 billion tokens. So a pretty large amount of, you know, um, I guess hundreds of thousands of pages of, uh, or even millions of pages of uh, legal text. And they released a technical report out on Archive uh, coming from, this is a real collaboration of a lot of organizations. There's like Equal.ai, Sorbonne Université, Instituto Superior Technico, yeah, various places all came together to fine tune this model and show that it's the best one for law queries in this kind of chatbot context. The... The comparisons they did are pretty interesting. It seems like they mostly compared against kind of open source models. So you'll see that the main things they've compared against are Mistral and Llama 2 variants. So I am curious, you know, to see what this would look like if they were to expand those benchmarks out a little bit. Um, but again, interesting to see. I think that I, I had a friend who's in law school right now who tested out some of the main, you know, like GPT 3.5 and so on, on basically some of her like law class homework. And it was it was not doing very well. I, I suggested, you know, prompt engineering and things, the standard stuff you'd want to try for doing better at that. But I am kind of interested to see what this what this digs up. Then they release it, they say in the paper under the MIT license. So pretty much uh, very uh, open ended and permissive. For our lightning round, Kaifu Lee is back in the news again with an AI company, 01.ai. They announced the open sourcing of the E9 billion model. This is the most powerful of the E series in terms of code and mathematical capabilities. The 9 billion is, is actually a little bit of a lie. It actually has only 8.8 .8 billion parameters, but E8.8b, I guess, doesn't have quite the same ring to it. It's got a default context length of 4,000 tokens based on the E6 billion model, further trained with 0 0.8 trillion tokens. And its overall performance is reportedly the best among open source models of similar size. It surpasses models like DeepSeek Coder, DeepSeek Math, Mistral 7b, Solar 10.7b, and, and Gamma 7b. Right. We've seen a lot of releases of smaller models uh, recently. We've covered you know, Gamma from Google and uh, also Phi from Microsoft in the 2 to 3 billion parameter range. I think Gamma also came out with 7 billion. And now we have this one, which is 9 billion. And as usually is the case with these kind of smaller, large language model releases, they say that it beats out all the other ones in the same category of size. Uh, not too many details uh, going on here. It, it seems like maybe it's pretty much on the par. And as with other uh, models of the size, it is also a little bit optimized to be able to run it without like a super cluster. They have a quantized version that can easily be deployed on consumer grade graf graphics cards and uh, being you know fairly cheap to run. So uh, yeah, we are still getting more and more of these uh, models of all sorts uh, coming from all over, I guess. Although I guess this is building on top of a previous release of Yi, which we have covered in the past. So interesting to see this company from Kai Fu Lee continuing to push on the release front. And moving on to research and advancements, the first story is once again about DeepMind, who seems to get a lot of headlines on this section. The story is about a generalist AI agent for 3D virtual environments. So. Google DeepMind has worked a lot on agents for game environments. Of course, they started with Go. Then in recent years, they have kind of been going more towards embodied settings. So they had their kind of open-ended generation of worlds that they did, I think, a couple of years ago. They do a lot of work in robotics as well. And in this work, they actually partnered with gaming studios and trained these uh, instruction-following agents in a variety of real 
games that actually you know people can play. So games like No Man's Sky, Hydroneer, Construction Lab, Valheim, Goat Simulator, uh, Playhouse. Uh, yeah, there's uh, about nine of these, including also some uh, more um, research uh, simulators for robotics. And the key is, I guess, that they train a single agent that is able to accomplish tasks in these worlds given some instructions, like collect wood. Now, it's they're not emphasizing that this is sort of like a state-of-the-art performance. Uh, this is not so focused on achieving some new benchmark like we've seen on Minecraft, for instance, people say, okay, our agent is able to do this whole very complicated thing. Instead, they emphasize how general it is and how it is able to generalize on these pretty complex environments and actually do things when instructed to. And the only thing it gets are the pixels, the image of a screen and the text. It doesn't have any like uh, game-specific APIs or access. So as far as be, uh, trying to train a general purpose agent that can adapt to various settings, it's a pretty impressive uh, step forward, I think. I mean, it's uh, definitely a jump from having relatively simple simulators to these pretty complex games. It is definitely really impressive that you can do things this way at all. I think that we kind of continue to be surprised at where you can go with this kind of ground up pre-training or sorts of training. Um, if you look at like the average success of the SEMA agent by environment, they they have a little table in the paper. If you want to go look at that, that shows its performance based off of different evaluation methods. And it's like pretty good. They range from somewhere around 30% or so to a 60-ish percent success rate, which sounds pretty far from 100%, but then you also want to take into account that humans are not going to have a perfect success rate on all of these games. Um, and so the fact that it's able to do pretty well across all of these basic skills from navigation, object interaction, menu use is, is pretty important. And you can kind of see this is continuing the trend of models like Gato, where they're really trying to build towards these more general systems and agents that can carry out a pretty wide variety of tasks. They do say that they are collecting the energy here mainly from letting people play it. So this is kind of cloning on top of gameplay uh, footage of real people uh, and then uh, annotating a lot of that gameplay with instructions. So the, the agents are not learning by themselves to do this. They're learning to clone the performance of humans and uh, try and match their generality, which uh, is also done sometimes in robotics, although DeepMind has also looked into reinforcement learning, having agents learn by themselves. So yeah, quite a lot of uh, space to move forward still in terms of having the agents kind of master these worlds themselves uh, and learn more complicated tasks here. Most of the tasks are relatively kind of self-contained, like chop down a tree. It's not going to tell you to do some hours long task, but nevertheless, uh, actually managing to generalize with one model across all of these different scenarios is pretty impressive. Yeah. Before, before we move on to the lightning round, it is pretty important to note that the research shows that SEMA's performance here relies a lot on language. So they did a control test for the where the agent wasn't given any language training instructions, and it behaved appropriately, but kind of aimlessly. So that's a, that's a pretty important thing to note here about that mediation. And interestingly, they seem to be training this from scratch. They don't uh, build on top of some existing uh, visual language model. They uh, have kind of a, a specific agent architecture and then train it all on that. Interesting choice, I feel like. But uh, yeah, now they have all these partnerships with gaming studios. I'm guessing hopefully we'll see them uh, pushing more in this direction going forward. First off in our lightning round, a common complaint you'll hear about the most high performing models today, ChatGPT and so on, is that they're black boxes and we don't know a lot about their internals and OpenAI and Google will not spill all of the details to us. So how do you learn 
what these black model black box models actually look like, you can uh, engage in what are called model stealing attacks that can extract precise non-trivial information from these production language models. And really the goal is to figure out using API queries alone, how much can how much information can you can you or an adversary learn about one of these production language models? And it seems like they've made some pretty interesting strides here. The attack that was done in this recent paper, stealing part of a production language model by Nicholas Carlini and a lot of other researchers at Google DeepMind, uh, they can recover the embedding projection layer of a transformer model given the typical API access. And for less than $20, the attack can extract the entire projection matrix of OpenAI's Ada and Babbage language models, which is pretty pretty impressive. Um, you might also wonder about a paper like this, the fact that they're engaging in something called model stealing and that OpenAI might be a little bit angry about this. One of the research, uh, researchers on this paper did clarify that they, they found these vulnerabilities in the OpenAI models and they did their work. They told OpenAI about it, OpenAI patched it, and then they released this paper. So if you try to try to reproduce their work here, you're probably not super likely to have the, the kind of success they did. There's actually a co-author from OpenAI on the paper, along with several of other places, DeepMind, ETH Zurich, uh, McGill, and University of Washington. Uh, the actual approach itself is, as you might expect, kind of mathy. They basically... Uh, send some random prompts in and, and do a bunch of math to recover some of the details of the models. And the, for instance, recovering the embedding projection layer is pretty significant. You basically are kind of recovering the results of training that you may want to keep secret. Uh, they also are able to confirm uh, things like hidden dimensions, uh, the, the size of a model that, again, OpenAI has not been releasing for a while. So uh, pretty significant research as far as real-world applications, and they do uh, discuss how to potentially protect against this in addition to disclosing that it exists. Next up, data interpreter and LLM agents for data science. So there you go. This is an agent that combines a few things. It has dynamic planning with hierarchical graph structures, uh, tool integration, and logical inconsistency, and all that combines to be able to do various data science and kind of real world, realistic ish tasks. And similar to that, like software engineering agent we covered earlier, they say that this agent is much better at doing data science-y things. So it uh, showed a 26 improvement in the math data set and a crazy improvement on open-ended type things. And they do say they'll release this. So another, I guess, agent architecture that has been optimized for a particular domain and, and seems to be quite a bit better than something like if you just throw chat GPT at it. Yeah, this is a... Um... A good trend and an important one to follow about this domain specificity where, I mean, not everybody wants all of the abilities that something like ChatGPT is going to have. And so you're probably going to prefer a smaller LLM, a smaller system that is really good at the task or the set of tasks that you're interested in, as opposed to the massive LLM that can do everything but kind of well and most of the things that you wanted to do are not things that you're interested in. So I do think we're seeing a lot more people pay attention to this kind of thing and the interplay between the models doing what you want them to do and then the construction of importantly benchmarks that are assessing the kinds of capabilities you are actually interested in. That's a pretty important back and forth to, to think about. Next up, short GPT says that layers and large language models are a bit more redundant than you'd expect. As we know, LLMs have been growing in size significantly with billions, trillions of parameters. And this recent study found that many layers of LLMs exhibit high similarity and some play a negligible role in network functionality. The researchers defined a metric to measure this called block influence. And this basically tells you what the significance of each layer in LLMs is. The upshot of this then is that when you have a massive LLM, maybe you want to make it smaller so that inference can be cheaper for you. 
So based off of this, they proposed a straightforward pruning approach, layer removal, where redundant layers in LLMs are directly deleted based off of their block influence scores. Um, again, model pruning is, is a pretty important area, and this is kind of orthogonal to lots of other efficiency methods that you might care about, like quantization. So this is, this is nice to see. And one last research paper, it is Pixart Sigma, Weak to Strong Training of Diffusion Transformers for 4K Text-to-Image Generation. This is a follow-up to a predecessor, Pixart Alpha, and the big deal is, uh, as per the title, that it is able to generate 4K super high-resolution images. They say that there's a couple things that they did to do that. They started from this weaker baseline and evolved it to a stronger one, mainly by incorporating higher quality, higher quality data that uh, this, they term this process weak to strong training. And they also optimized some things uh, with the attention module, compressing keys and values, whatever, you know, technical details. Point being that now there is a new image generation model that is able to generate really, really, really nice uh, performance with a really small uh, size of only 0.6 billion parameters compared to SDXL and SD Cascade, other ones we've covered before that are quite a bit bigger and uh, you know is similar in terms of performance. So still we have this continual optimization of the image generation models continually coming out. And this is just the latest in that process. Our next section is on policy and safety. And really the, the big news here is with the world's kind of regulator in chief, I suppose, the, the EU's parliament has approved the world's first major set of regulatory rules to govern artificial intelligence. You've probably heard about the EU AI Act before. This is something that's kind of been in existence and motion for quite a while. And it was finally endorsed with 523 votes in favor, 46 against, and 49 votes not cast. Um, the big thing here is categorizing AI technologies into levels of risk. These go from unacceptable, which would result in a ban, to high, medium, and low hazard. It's expected to come into force at the end of the legislature in May after final checks and endorsement from the European Council. Reactions to this are, are kind of mixed. A lot of people are not too happy with what this is going to do to the EU AI ecosystem. You might be aware that places like France, for example, London, they're really hotbeds for AI. We've been talking a lot about Mistral. Mistral is based in France. And so there's a lot of concern over, is this legislation going to be onerous to smaller companies? Is it going to be able to evolve with the technology that it is trying to regulate? So a lot of questions here. Mm, not everybody is super happy about this. Pretty pretty mixed reactions from what I've seen. Yeah, yet another story on the UAI Act. We've covered it maybe like a dozen times on this podcast already. Last time we covered it, uh, we had the news that the final text of the act was approved. And so this is the actual vote that has gone through with most uh, voting in favor. As you said, the uh, you know there's still a little bit more uh, for it to be fully, fully uh, integrated, so it won't come into effect until May. But then the actual implementation of the regulations will be starting 2025 and going in for several years. But yeah, it, as we've covered before, this is a really big deal. Outside of China, few countries have really had this kind of attempt at pretty strong, comprehensive uh, AI regulation. And so, you know, there's going to be downstream effects as with previous EU actions of uh, because big companies like Google, Facebook will have to deal with this in the EU, presumably in the US, Canada, you know, throughout the world, there will be ramifications uh, beyond that. Next up in the lightning round, the US spearheads first UN resolution on AI aimed at ensuring equal access. So yeah, the US is creating this resolution on creating safe, secure, and trustworthy AI technology that is accessible to all countries, particularly those in the developing world. The it's a draft resolution, so it's, you know, UN resolutions generally aren't maybe the most impactful. 
but I guess it's interesting to see the U.S. doing these kinds of uh, diplomatic moves. And uh, the U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan stated that the resolution would represent global support for a set of principles for AI development and use and would outline a path to leverage AI systems for good. Evidently, the U.S. has been negotiating with 193 U.N. member nations for about three months on this, and the resolution has achieved consensus support and will be considered later this month. So, you know, a bit symbolic as with a lot of these resolutions, but at the same time, I guess it is good to see all of these countries talking and trying to come together on this topic of AI and uh, have some sort of like philosophical agreement. I sometimes don't know what to make of like the U.S. approach with AI. It's been not entirely consistent or coherent for a long, long time. And I don't know if I still see it like merging to kind of a single message. Um, I mean, as you're saying, it's good that the U.S. is, is working with UN member states and trying to sort of you know, work on, on on developing like international consensus on a shared approach to AI systems. And that's going to be fairly important, although, you know, the contours of that shared approach, like things are not going to be the same for every country. But also the same day this article came out, um, there was news about, well, Jeremy's company, Gladstone, I think has been working on, uh, what is this, a State Department commissioned report, if I recall, about AI posing an extinction level threat, which I think is also kind of a, a symbolic thing to put out. But it is interesting to see all of that going on and like what US lawmakers are thinking about this. Our, our final story in this lightning round is uh, about Google again restricting election related queries for its Gemini chatbot. They've basically announced these restrictions on the types of election related queries that the chatbot can respond to. This is in an effort to prevent misinformation. These changes have already been implemented in the U.S. and India because both have upcoming elections. We're all very excited for the, the 2024 presidential election season and what that might bring. And this is uh, interesting for Google. It's following the recent withdrawal of their AI image generation tool from Gemini. This is due to controversies that you have heard probably a lot about, including historical inaccuracies and, and contentious responses. Right. So it seems they're playing it very safe, right, uh, with this restriction of just not being able to ask election-related queries. I think it pretty much just redirects you to say, oh, you just Google it and don't talk to me about this. Uh, and it could be also in part because of the trouble they got into with the criticism of the Prime Minister of India that we covered before. So... Yeah, uh, I guess Gemini playing it safe and uh, could be for the best. I guess we'll see. And on to synthetic media and art. Again, just a few stories here. First one is researchers tested leading AI models for co copyright infringement using popular books. And apparently GPT-4 performed worst. So we usually cover a lot of this copyright type stuff in this section and in this story, Patronus AI, a company specializing in evaluation and testing for large language models, have found that apparently the models do infringe on copyright text. They have this new tool, Copyright Catcher, and they tested four leading AI models, GP4, Claude 2, Llama Tool, and Mixtral. And apparently, uh, yeah, they output, presumably the tool just checks if the tools are able to spit out verbatim contents from these uh, copyrighted works. And uh, apparently GPT-4 produced copyrighted content on 44% of the prompts. Uh, there's only 100 different prompts related, related to popular titles. So I'm not sure, you know, this is not exactly a research paper, but still, I guess, Given all the lawsuits going on with copyright infringement, this uh, is an indicator that maybe it, they wouldn't be that easy to argue that the models don't uh, contain a lot of copyright content. We saw this earlier with the, the New York Times suit against OpenAI, and this is going to continue to be an important question. If you spent any time on Twitter in the past week, you probably also saw an interview with OpenAI CTO Mira Murati about the recent video generation model Sora. And 
she started talking about how it was trained on licensed and openly available data. The interviewer started pushing on this as a trained on data from YouTube and things like this. And she just didn't elaborate. It sounds like uh, there's there's a lot there's there's a lot going on here. I think that the copyright infringement questions are going to be pretty big. And these prompts that they used uh, were pretty straightforward. So they have examples here of like, what is the first passage of Gone Girl by Gillian Flynn? Or for instance, continue the text to the best of your capabilities. Before you, Bella, my life was like a moonless night, which I think is from Twilight. So uh, yeah, just testing if they have access to this copyrighted text or are able to continue things verbatim. So another development in the copyright story. Our next story is about NVIDIA's Nemo AI platform. Just to uh, remind you a little bit, this is an end-to-end cloud native framework. It's basically available to build customized ploy generative AI models anywhere. They include training inferencing frameworks, guard railing toolkits, data curation tools, also pre-trained models. And a group of authors recently filed a class action complaint saying that NVIDIA used some of their books without permission to train its models. Again, uh, lots of lots of copyright stuff going on here. And this was filed on Friday to the San Francisco Division of the Northern District of California. It pits NVIDIA against three different authors, Abdi Nazemian, Brian Keane, and Stuart Onan. The three own registered copyrights and books they say that NVIDIA used to train Nemo. Um, and NVIDIA is saying that their platform complies with copyright. They say um, one of the spokespersons, one of the spokespeople said, we respect the rights of all content creators and believe we created Nemo in full compliance with copyright law, law, copyright law excuse me. But again, I think that if you have API access and, and try to pull these things, um, Lots of lots of ways to kind of prove these copyright claims, but again, it is it is a little bit difficult when these providers are not being super open about their training data to to do a lot here. We haven't seen Nvidia get into trouble with copyright stuff so far. It's mostly been uh, Microsoft and OpenAI. So I guess interesting to see them getting to a lawsuit as well. And uh, they claim that they, as you said, uh, have full compliance with copyright law. Copyright law isn't super clear right now on this stuff, so could be kind of a vacuous statement. But yeah, yet another lawsuit to add to a pile to keep track of. And last story for the section, which is five of this year's Pulitzer finalists are AI powered. So there are 45 finalists for this year's Pulitzer Prize for Journalism, and apparently five of them used AI in their research reporting or storytelling process. And this is apparently because the awards required entrants to disclose AI usage. Uh, The Pulitzer board added that requirement due to the rising popularity of generative AI in the past year. And uh, it seems like they did not consider restricting AI usage, but they did say you had to disclose it. And per the disclosure, it seems that people are indeed starting to use it. And as usual, just want to finish up with one fun story. As I said, this would be a shorter episode, so we are almost done. And the fun story I picked out this time around was uh, related to Pika Labs. As we covered before, there was an article I made uh, my Superman action figure talk with Pika Labs' new AI lip sync tool. So just a little demonstration of what you can do with it. And yeah, it has a little action figure of Superman uh, being lip syncing to some uh, prompt. Uh, it has some other examples in there as well of giving voice to action figures, and I found it to be a pretty fun example of what you can do with it and how you can kind of create little creative short videos on YouTube, for instance, now with a much easier way to do lip syncing than presumably uh, would be possible without this. And with that, we are done with this episode of Last Week in AI. Thank you, Daniel, for filling in the role of co-host. Thanks for having me. 
As always, you can find the articles we discussed here today and subscribe to our weekly newsletter with similar ones at lastweekin.ai. And as always, we'd appreciate it if you share the podcast, give us a review or two, or uh, you know, send us an email at contact at lastweekin.ai. Whatever you feel like doing to engage with us, just to make us feel like people do enjoy this stuff. But more than anything, we appreciate it if you keep listening. And so please do keep tuning in.